Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Frick Collection. My name is Emerson Bowyer, and I am Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow here at the museum. Um, before we begin, I'd like to thank the Robert H. Smith Family Foundation for very generously making today's event possible. Today I have the great pleasure of introducing my good friend and colleague, Dr. Nat Silver, former Andrew W. Mellon Curatorial Fellow at the Frick, and currently the guest curator of Piero della Francesco in America, the marvelous exhibition which has had its home here in the Oval Room for some months now. And I should take this opportunity to, to remind you to perhaps take another look at the paintings after today's lecture, as this is Piero's last weekend with us. Dr. Silva received his master's degree from the Courtauld Institute and his doctorate from University College in London. His doctoral dissertation analyzed the life and work of the 15th century painter, Pesolino. Dr. Silva edited and contributed to the current exhibition catalog on Piero and has contributed to many other catalogs and journals. Most recently, he was the recipient of two postdoctoral research fellowships at the Cini Foundation and the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence. With those fellowships, he will soon begin work on a project about the history, function, and contribution of the predella in Italian Renaissance art. Please welcome Dr. Silva. Thank you, Emerson, for those very kind words. And I'd also like to thank all of my friends and colleagues here at the Frick uh, for everything that they've taught me over the last three years. How does an exhibition come together? What does it entail? And who is involved? Over the past two years, I have had the privileged opportunity to find out. The seven paintings hanging today in the Frick's Oval Room represent only the end product of a complicated genesis that necessitated the participation of many individuals. As a process, an exhibition can be likened to the commission of an altarpiece or the orchestration of a piece of music. Both are decidedly collaborative endeavors that require the support and guidance of individual or corporate patrons. In this case, inspiration came from the Frick's director, Ian Wardropper, deputy director, Colin Bailey, and curator, Denise Allen, standing here before the Frick's own high altar to Piero. Gothic polyptics and Renaissance palais demanded both local and extramural expertise. To produce the kind of towering and majestic altarpieces that define the Italian Renaissance required the careful cooperation of a close-knit community. Experts in their respective fields furnished the raw materials before painting could even begin. Merchants supplied the pigments and brushes. Carpenters erected the wooden structure. Trained specialists gilded their surfaces and others prepared its panels for painting. Just like the most successful of Renaissance workshops, the Frick has the finest in-house team, including veteran conservators, registrars, editorial staff, security officers, designers, art handlers, press officers, librarians, and archivists. Individuals further afield contributed to the exhibition catalog, and the same ethos of teamwork to find its preparations. As I learned, a multi-author publication, like a piece of choral music, relies on many voices acting in harmony, listening, and responding to one another. The Piero Quintet came to consist of extraordinary scholars James Banker, Machtelt Israels, Giacomo Guazzini, and Elena Squilantini, for all of whose contributions I'm incredibly grateful. This picture best sums up the spirit of what Professor Israels aptly characterized as a project that was eminently and pleasantly collaborative. Along the way, we benefited from opportunities for discussion and debate, both amongst ourselves and the wider community of Renaissance scholars. Whether at this pranzo Pier Francescano, exploring the churches of Borgo San Sepulcro, or presenting research at a London conference dedicated to the study of Renaissance altarpieces, friends and colleagues in Europe and the United States offered our team Piero the warmest of welcomes. Technical study and the open exchange of ideas were defining features in this project. Back in New York, we examined the individual paintings on site. Conservators from the Metropolitan Museum of Art's Sherman Fairchild Conservation Center transformed the Frick's enamels room into a temporary lab complete with infrared scanning equipment and microscopes. 
Here you see conservator Sean Digny Peer at work on the crucifixion. Ideas flowed back and forth between scholars on both sides of the Atlantic. Most recently, many of the same colleagues who weighed in on All Matters Piero throughout the course of our research came here to the Frick and trained their expert eyes on his works in our galleries. Suffice to say that I am profoundly grateful for the many generous acts of friendship and professional collegiality that enabled the research underpinning this exhibition and its catalog, Piero della Francesca in America, from San Sepulcro to the East Coast. You might ask, why America and why San Sepulcro? All of the paintings by Piero in the United States, as well as Lisbon St. Augustine here in our exhibition, were originally made for his hometown of San Sepulcro, or Borgo San Sepulcro, as it was known in the 15th century. In his own time, the city boasted a flourishing economy. As a result of its strategic location and the cultivation of woad, a plant processed for its valuable indigo textile dye, it attracted even larger populations than the nearest Florentine dominion city of Arezzo. When Borgo was annexed to Florence in 1441, Piero della Francesca was nearly 30 years old. The place in which he grew to manhood had an established identity, hardly provincial, but rather remarkably diverse. Major mercantile and minor pilgrimage routes passed through the city. For politics and customs, citizens looked east to Rimini and the marches, west to Siena, north to Florence, and south to Rome. Equally, the region's spiritual geography placed Borgo well within reach of several important shrines. 50 miles to the south is the Basilica of San Francesco at Assisi. Francis himself once preached in Borgo and received the stigmata at nearby Laverna. Sacred sites in the vicinity were venerated not only by the Franciscans, but also by the followers of St. Romuald at Camaldoli, which you see here, and Augustine at Tolentino. As one historian eloquently observed, it is in this region that one, quote, walks with the saints in the palm of God's hand. The seven paintings assembled at the Frick for this exhibition represent two of Piero's local commissions. The first, the Sant'Augustino altarpiece, a reconstruction of which you see here, towered over the high altar of Borgo's Augustinian church. Ordered in 1454 and completed in 1469, it was dismantled in the 16th century and many of its images are now lost. My installation brings together six of its eight extant panels. The second commission featured in this show is a rectangular painting depicting the virgin and child enthroned with four angels. Described in the 16th century in the house of a local family, its patron and original destination are unknown. Since each of the two projects was undertaken for San Sepulcro, this exhibition offered a unique opportunity to reflect upon Piero's exploits in the city of his birth. Together, both devotional images raise questions regarding the importance of place in Piero's work and suggest the painter's sensitivity to the indigenous identity of his own community, its visual culture, and natural environment. I would argue that Piero embedded in many of his images for San Sepulcro a profound sense of locale and one that might have been appreciated by its residents. Writing in praise of Piero della Francesca two years after his death in Borgo San Sepulcro, another local luminary, the mathematician Luca Pacioli, set the painter's accomplishments in terra nostra, or in our homeland, on equal footing with those in Urbino, Bologna, Ferrara, Rimini, Ancona, and Arezzo. Continuing the encomia, Pacioli paid tribute to Piero as a monarch of painting and a celebrated compatriot, commemorating his artistic genius and local heritage. From Borgo's gates to its town hall, on the high altars of its churches and on the walls of its homes, Piero's altarpieces, frescoes, banners, and even candlesticks honored and endowed the urban fabric of his town with an unparalleled visual legacy. He dominated the market for major artistic commissions in a city politically and economically beholden to Florence, but one which conspicuously neglected to hire its many talented painters. More of Piero's extant documented works are known for Borgo than any other city. Whether this geographical disparity is an issue of preservation and survival, or reflects accurately the painter's efforts, Piero labored tirelessly for his hometown. Beginning with his birth in 1412, Piero della Francesca made Borgo his home, establishing a lifelong connection that lasted almost 80 years. The city shaped his career in its formative stages. Pioneering research published by James Banker demonstrated that he learned how to paint within its walls and undertook his first independent commissions for its turrets and churches. In 
By the time he reached Florence in 1439, Piero was arguably more than a capable painter. One year later in Modena, as witness to the commission of an altarpiece, he is already described as a master or magistro. As his career progressed, Piero undertook commissions across the Italian peninsula for the Pope, the Duke of Urbino, and many other celebrity clients. Several extant works, including this flagellation at Urbino, are inscribed with his signature. Piero signed paintings, all of which were arguably made for Florentine, excuse me, foreign patrons, proclaim his origins as proudly as those of any of his Florentine or Sienese contemporaries. Stylistically, his works look nothing like theirs, reminding modern viewers of the painter's atypical roots. If Borgo is somehow crucial to our understanding of Piero's artistic identity, then how might its location, traditions, and existing works of art have inspired the images that he produced at home? And how might this context better help us to understand, as Bernard Berenson once put it, the ineloquent or unemotional paintings of Piero della Francesca? Instead of starting with the works in this exhibition, I would like to begin with one generally recognized to be his earliest surviving painting, the National Gallery's Baptism of Christ. Probably dating to the late 1440s, this panel originally occupied the central compartment of the now disassembled high altarpiece for the church of San Giovanni Battista in Val d'Afra. It survives in two parts. As you can see from this reconstruction by Machtelt Israels, the triptych was started by Piero, but another painter, Matteo Di Giovanni, finished it. Their conspicuously joint authorship was probably the product of necessity rather than design. We know that Piero was often called away from Borgo to take up commissions in foreign cities, and significant delays are recorded in the documents for several other local projects. In this case, his clients may not have been willing to wait. Whatever the actual explanation, the contrasting painting styles of Matteo and Piero, which so often disturb modern viewers, evidently did not obstruct the devotional efficacy of its images. Landscape, which features so prominently in the baptism, is a signature element of several paintings for, by Piero for Borgo San Sepulcro, including the Resurrection, the Nativity, and the Nativity of Christ, both of which you see here with the baptism. His fascination with detailed and dramatic vistas is often associated with an awareness of Flemish paintings, but it can also be traced to more local interests. Marilyn Levin, for example, argued convincingly that the topography of this holy land was inspired by Borgo's actual surroundings, and that signal features within the landscape reflect elements of its origin myth. The painter chose to situate this scene within a natural environment that evokes the upper Tiber Valley, the surroundings of his native town. Bringing Christ's baptism to Borgo seems to parallel a foundational event of Christianity with the city's divinely inspired inception. According to its foundation legend, a pair of pilgrims, Arcano and Giglio, returning from Jerusalem with relics of the Holy Sepulchre, stopped to rest in a valley. They witnessed a miracle on this wooded site, and an oratory was constructed to protect their sacred trove. Crowds of believers flocked to this place, and a city took shape around it. Legend aside, by the first half of the 15th century, Borgo boasted a substantial population, and two versions of the story survive from this period. As Christa Gardner von Teufel has argued, images of both pilgrims on the piers of local altarpieces, and you see one example here, Giglio on the left and Arcano on the right from the piers of the baptism altarpiece for San Giovanni Battista in Val d'Afra. <clears throat> Images of both pilgrims on the piers of local altarpieces accentuated the Comune's growing concern with the town's legendary forefathers. That their names were also inscribed in the 1441 city statutes seems to confirm an engagement or re-engagement with aspects of Borgo's reputed origins at an impressionable stage in Piero's career. Planted immediately next to Christ in the foreground is a flourishing walnut tree, emblematic of the Valle di Nocia, where Arcano and Giglio reputedly stopped on their way home from the Holy Land. Its remarkable height and substantial canopy evoke the grandissimi noci, or tallest walnut trees, beneath which the city's founders sought shelter, and in whose branches Arcano subsequently witnessed the miracle that compelled them to leave the relics. Although robust walnuts were a defining feature of the pre-Christian terrain, Piero also included several stumps in the valley behind Christ. They certainly allude to the prophecy by St. John the Baptist, foreshadowing the coming Messiah. 
At the same time, however, such visible deforestation could have evoked interventions by local believers who, according to the legend, cleared a space in the forest and constructed buildings on it to protect the relics. This painting elaborates on Borgo's reputed links to the Holy Land. One scholar has pointed out that the baptism is celebrated as a feast of Christ rather than of St. John the Baptist. Thus, the donor of this altarpiece chose the one episode in the life of John that links him to a town named after the Savior's holy sepulcher. Piero's landscape, with a city and a river running past it, then contributed contemporary specificity to the biblical event. As Scott Nethersall recently demonstrated, the walled settlement in the distance is a remarkably exact portrait of Borgo, defined by its solid fortifications and multiple bell towers. He also indicated that the city's geographical location, positioned at the foot of some hills and situated between the Alpi della Luna, or the Mountains of the Moon, and the Tiber, recast here as the Jordan. The biblical river in which Christ stands captures a crystalline reflection of the upper Tiber Valley in its flow emphasizing this region's miraculous past in the viewer's present and cementing belief in Borgo's own sanctity with pictorial authority. A river reflecting in it, in its surface, the kind of hills that rise above Borgo was also especially well suited to the principal furnishing of this church. San Giovanni Battista in Val d'Afra was dedicated to St. John the Baptist, but identified by the Afra stream, a tributary of the Tiber that runs out of the mountains and near to the town. Even the sprigs of foliage closest to the worshiper in the immediate foreground were potentially recognizable to contemporaries. Seven different species of indigenous herbs have been identified at the right and left sides of this painting. A tall leafy specimen with a sturdy stem has so far eluded definitive identification, but one possible interpretation is woad, the hardy plant grown outside Borgo's walls and processed for its valuable indigo textile dye. Tilled furrows, like the one you see just here, called to mind the fields where the citizens cultivated their cash crop, transforming the region's legendary forest into arable land that provided the economic sustenance necessary to maintain their spiritual legacy. Now leaving behind the parish church of Borgo's Val d'Afra and moving into its town center, we find that local landscape reemerges as an underlying theme in Piero's resurrection. Painted around 1460, he also relocated this episode in the life of Christ from the Holy Land to the mountainous Upper Tiber region. Enfilades of trees that converge on the Savior suggested the forested terrain above Borgo. Christ, his tomb, and the soldiers dominate the immediate foreground. The abundant, if damaged, landscape behind them lacks the detail of his baptism, but its schematic thrust is well suited to an emblem of Borgo's identity. An official seal figuring Christ resurrected was apparently attached to the city's statutes, and heraldic banners bore the image of his tomb, all of which are now lost. In this fresco, Piero recast the biblical event for compatriots who identified the Holy Land with their immediate surroundings, emphasizing the continual efficacy of the resurrection in the local viewers present. This fresco adorned the city's government council chamber, or residenza, potently expressing communal dignity and local pride. Constructed by citizens in the 13th century, they situated the residenza opposite Borgo's largest church, the Camaldolese Abbey. Controversially, the townspeople had erected it, that is the residenza, on top of a cemetery belonging to the monks. Their abbot controlled large tracts of land and regularly asserted his proprietary authority over the citizenry. The city's violation of his order's hallowed ground had been one of many native expressions of rebellion during the Middle Ages. Shortly after Florentine authorities assumed control of Borgo during Piero's lifetime, the local conservatory made a similar gesture. They initi initiated substantial improvements to the residenza, which eventually included the commission of Piero's resurrection. The victorious image of Christ rising from the Holy Sepulchre celebrated Borgo's legacy from the Holy Land, forging a visible link with their legendary spiritual heritage that transcended both temporal and political boundaries. Piero positioned Christ outside a city, as it is described in the Bible, planting his standard in the ground like the victor of a battle, the triumphant savior stakes his claim to the entire region as sacred ground restored. The legend of Borgo's mythical foundation claimed that this city had been established in the same year that Jerusalem was captured by the infidel. 
Faith rather than fact fueled the local desire to imagine Borgo as the Christian Jerusalem. But Piero's relocation of the resurrection from the Holy Land to the upper Tiber Valley mirrored the translation of its relics from Jerusalem to Borgo San Sepulcro. His fresco offered the local government an image that vividly proclaimed its city's adopted identity as Jerusalem recovered. High up on the wall, Christ kept watch over Borgo's representatives who met beneath it and impressed upon their decisions an eternal authority invested by faith rather than Florence. In this fresco, Piero reinterpreted an image of the resurrection by the Sienese master painter Niccolò di Segna. Executed in the mid-14th century, this painting occupied the central compartment of a polyptych that towered over the high altar of the city's abbey and is seen here in a reconstruction by Machtel Israels. Piero's monumental treatment of the same subject, the composition of Christ, his pink cloak, and the horizontal disposition of his tomb deliberately recall the altarpiece's principal panel. While Niccolo's painting may not have been the city's most familiar local image of the resurrection, that accolade would have gone to the many official seals and banners bearing images of the same subject, his painting, with its richly gilded surface, was certainly its most lavish. By reintroducing its signal features and recasting the event within local terrain, Piero created a powerful alternative. His fresco offered a civic counterpart to the abbey's polyptych. If the Sienese master's altarpiece signaled Camel de Lazy hegemony to the fellow citizens beholden to the abbot's wealth and influence, then this fresco spaliera celebrated their independence from it and reclaimed the same image with an equally monumental version executed by the town's most illustrious native son. Furthermore, both resurrections are located in buildings that face each other today, just as they did in the 15th century. Together, these two paintings, executed more than 100 years apart, epitomize Borgo's close connection with its own history. Piero repeatedly emphasized this continuity in his paintings, which project the town's imagined biblical past into its present environment. Echoes of another locally meaningful model can also be found in the resurrection. Christa Gardner von Teufel first raised the possibility that the physiognomy of Piero's savior was inspired by a highly venerated sculpture, the Volto Santo, that you see here on the left. The similarities are hardly definitive, but their more than typological resemblance is intriguing. Piero did not reuse a facial type from his earlier painting of the baptism, or from elsewhere in his own work, as he often did. Beyond the standard hallmarks of Christ's physiognomy familiar to 15th century viewers, such as the bisected beard and long brown hair, he introduced similarly wide open almond-shaped eyes. Unlike the earlier countenance, Piero's figure of Christ has no pupils, only opaque discs that emphasize his frontal stare. The Messiah's eyes are darkly modeled in their sockets beneath a high brow and leave an impression of physical prominence that is roughly equivalent to its sculpted predecessor. Their penetrating gazes are orchestrated into very different expressions, one of acceptance and the other of confrontation. But the vivid whites that emerge from the surface of both impress upon the viewer a shared sense of vitality. If Piero looked to Niccolo's triumphant savior when creating his fresco for Borgo's premier civic building, then it is not impossible to imagine that he also turned to the Volto Santo. That the Volto Santo may have offered a compelling model is also suggested by circumstantial evidence. The figure was believed to have been brought to Borgo from the Holy Land, where it had been sculpted by Nicodemus, who prepared the body of Christ for burial. An angel reputedly finished its head by carving the face, and this part of the statue's anatomy inspired fervent admirers. In 1440, thieves from nearby Citta di Castello were foiled in an unsuccessful attempt to make off with the cranium of Borgo's revered statue. Sacred to the community, Borgo enshrined the Volto Santo civic status in the city statutes and installed the sculpture in the baptismal church, or Pieve. That it was located in the Pieve rather than in any building maintained by a religious order is significant. There, the Volto Santo may have embodied aspirations of autonomy from the city's single biggest landlord, the Camel de Lazy Abbot, marking it out as potential inspiration for a civic emblem. Whether or not Piero intentionally reworked details of the sculpture's head in his fresco, their shared features may well have been a suggestive reminder of his community's miraculous inheritance. Sculpture introduces an important theme in Piero's art. 
In addition to the Volto Santo, he seems to have been inspired by other sculpted devotional images. In 1445, members of a confraternity dedicated to the Madonna of Mercy hired Piero to furnish their oratory with a new altarpiece. He painted the Virgin, surrounded by devotees, seeking shelter in the shadow of her ample cloak, flanked by four full-length saints. With the stillness of statues, they seem to project a quiet presence, encouraging an appropriately contemplative state of mind. Kenneth Clark famously saw them as pieces of polychrome statuary. While he sought to account for their plasticity and presence by positing a link between Piero and the Florentine painter Masaccio, such visual qualities may also be indebted to precedents closer at hand. Sculpture arguably shaped the city's visual vocabulary of sacred images. As in many cities, polychrome statuary predominated in Borgo San Sepulcro, where few painted panel altarpieces predate Piero's career. At least nine documented and extant statues from the period, well, that is to say from the 7th to the 15th century, have long-standing presence within the city's devotional topography. Amongst these six survivors, two stand out for their persistent roles in Borgo's civic and spiritual life. In addition to the Volto Santo in the Pieve, a celebrated virgin and child group in the Abbey, seen here on the left, was looked after by its own confraternity. Nicknamed the Madonna della Badia, or the Madonna of the Abbey, this sculpture was signed by a priest named Martinez, dated 1199, and inscribed with the words, on the lap of the father, excuse me, on the lap of the mother shines the wisdom of the father. If the current state of gilding is at all indicative of its 15th century appearance, then its material value alone could even be compared to that of Niccolò di Segna's costly gold ground altarpiece in the same church. If Piero's figure of the Virgin recalls the appearance of polychromed medieval statuary, then she may have appealed to an audience closely familiar with them. Documents tell us that in the 1430s, this confraternity owned a statue of the Madonna. Whether or not Piero's altarpiece was intended to replace it, the face of his magnificent image of the Virgin, sheltering a local flock, recalls that of a sculpture. Her pallid complexion, ovoid head, and remarkably columnar neck hardly emulate human physiognomy. Instead, I would argue that they echo features of a wooden statue, like the Madonna della Badia, in the lack of visible hair, the prominent ears, and expressionless mouth. A roughly similar visage also belongs to a local venerated virgin and child sculpted in the 13th century. Situated above town at the Hermitage of Monte Casale, it continued to attract donations from a substantial percentage of Borgo's population. Piero himself left bequests to the confraternities that maintained local cult images, both inside the city and beyond its walls. The similarities of Piero's virgin to sculpted images were more than simply physiognomic. They also related to his choice of accessories. The Misericordia Virgin's blue mantle is secured at the neck with a large ruby in a setting framed by pearls. You can see that here. Her magnificent gold crown, punctuated by smaller cabochons, can be compared, for example, to the substantial ruby-studded band worn by a 14th century statue of the Virgin today in the cathedral. As was the case in other cities as well, the most spectacular bejeweled ornaments were not integral to individual statues, but were independent commissions. A 15th century crown in San Sepulcro's local museum suggests the potential for material adornment of local statues. Constructed of two tiers encrusted with multiple settings for colored glass cabochons, this object is traditionally linked to the Volto Santo, which it crowned on feast days, then as today. While impressive, such regal splendor was hardly reserved for this statue alone and can be identified in several other instances. The gilded silver structure studded with small figures also suggests the appearance of a lost crown commissioned from a Borgo goldsmith in 1465 for the Madonna della Badia and described in recently discovered documents. She attracted remarkable ornaments, including another diadem, that is a third uh, crown, bequeathed to a local monastery with the stipulation that it would pass to the Badia Madonna if the monks failed to use it for their own terracotta figure of the Virgin. Splendid ornaments commonly adorned sculpted images in central Italy. The crown, however, was not an iconographic requirement for the Virgin of Mercy, nor did Piero include it in other extant images of the Virgin, both of which you see here were made for extramural patrons. That Piero took trouble to crown this queen of heaven in Borgo may have been intended to suggest both the appearance of statues and the rituals of dressing them. 
To paint on panel an image more commonly found in sculpture also offered Piero opportunities for invention. By way of comparison, I show you here a roughly contemporary Madonna della Misericordia from the cathedral at Camerino. This virgin, like Piero's, towers over the worshipers that surround her. In order to preserve their visibility, this sculptor stacked figures in three separate tiers. Piero, by contrast, kept them all on the ground, emphasizing the impression of an actual congregation gathered around an image of the Virgin and exploiting a composition too complex to achieve within a single block of wood or stone. Devotees encircled beneath the protective folds of her cloak and disposed at different angles encouraged the viewer to imagine the Virgin as a figure in the round. She appears to receive petitions delivered from all sides, an act not only unlikely but in fact impossible to perform between any of Borgo's statues. The Madonna della Badia, the Virgin and Child at Monte Casale, and other sculptures are all uncarved at the back. Their apparent completeness is a sculptural illusion that Piero brilliantly reworked in paint, arguably refining a familiar dimension of his audience's devotional encounter, and one that they were already well prepared to appreciate. Piero's awareness of place is manifest not only in the formal vocabulary of his devotional images, but also in their content. One of the most exciting paintings in my exhibition is the figure of St. Augustine from the eponymous altarpiece. This polyptic, commissioned in 1454 and finished in 1469, towered over the high altar of Borgo's Augustinian church for almost 100 years. Vasari praised the St. Augustino polyptic as una cosa molto lodata, or something highly praised and it is in fact Piero's largest known altarpiece commission. Machtelt Israels has convincingly argued that its main tier alone measured over three and a half meters across, wider than his San Giovanni d'Afra and Misericordia polyptics, which we have just seen before. The principal tier featured a large central image, which is now lost, that probably depicted the Virgin and Child enthroned or the coronation of the Virgin. Flanking it were four full-length figures of saints, Augustine, here, Michael Archangel, John the Evangelist, and Nicholas of Tolentino. Below, the predella contained narrative episodes depicting the Passion of Christ. At either side, it was supported by piers whose bases were decorated on the front and sides with three-quarter length figures. And here you see two of them, Saint Monica and Saint Leonard. Any other missing panels must remain in the realm of hypothesis, but they likely included pinnacles and the other paintings here indicated in gray. If the Misericordia altarpiece can be characterized as a corporately financed endeavor, then this enterprise was more of a family affair. Name saints of the mule herder, Angelo, who commissioned the Sant'Augustino altarpiece, and his father, Giovanni, appear in privileged places flanking the central panel. That is here and here. That saints Michael and John were also respectively the guardian and patron saints of San Sepulcro invested this important undertaking with appropriate civic honor. They paid Piero the impressive salary of 320 florins. By comparison, a roughly contemporary but double-sided altarpiece painted by the talented Sassetta in another local church cost 510 florins, or roughly 255 per side, compared to Piero's 320. Piero's substantial compensation suggests both the size of this commission and, by age 42, the esteem of his fellow citizens for their celebrated compatriot who is in constant demand by the Pope, the Duke of Urbino, and other rulers of wealth and prestige. As many scholars have noted, the Sant'Augustino altarpiece is the product of an artist at the height of his abilities, but it also suggests one who engaged thoughtfully with its location. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at this saint. Piero depicted Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, dressed in the ceremonial attire of his office, as if in perpetual visitation of his churches. Crowned with a jeweled mitre, which you see here, he carries a crozier in one finely gloved hand that emerges from a heavily tasseled sleeve and bears his delicately embroidered cope over the simple black habit of an Augustinian hermit friar. The translucent clarity of his rock crystal crozier and sumptuous double pile of his blue velvet brocade capture the light, rendering his worldly trappings in a transcendent splendor. Careful attention that Piero devoted to his garments was probably also appreciated by the same family of lay donors, two of whom had contributed 100 florins to the Augustinian hermit friars for a pair of liturgical vestments described in the bequest as beautiful and costly. Sadly, they don't survive. The luxurious Orfrey border, 
of this cope invests Augustine with all the authority of a doctor of the church. Fictive embroidery was hardly un an unusual complement to contemporary images of Augustine, but it typically depicted only single figures. One example is this image of the same saint today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He comes from a polyptic made for an Augustinian church, perhaps in Cortona, signed by Giovanni di Paolo, and dated 1454, the same year that Piero received his commission in Borgo. The Borgo figure instead depict, featured pairs of saints and narrative scenes. Two full-length duos are depicted on each shoulder. To the left, St. Peter holding his keys and St. Paul with his sword. And to the right, John the Baptist in a brown hair shirt with his staff next to <clears throat> another saint, possibly John the Evangelist. Unfolding across Augustine's body beneath them are eight narrative episodes from the life of Christ set in luminous landscapes and monumental interiors. Beginning at the top left and descending, its scenes depict the Annunciation, the Nativity, the flight into Egypt, Christ's presentation in the temple, and his agony in the garden. Moving to the right side, and again starting from the top, the story continues with the flagellation, the crucifixion, and just a figure of Mary Magdalene that you see below it. This scene, just visible in the last compartment, suggests that the episode is perhaps the deposition or the entombment. While one scholar concluded that Piero's combination of narrative scenes and saints reflects Augustine's commitment to the defense of Catholic orthodoxy against heresy, they can also be interpreted in the context of his city. Christa Gardner von Teufel has observed that quotations from Christ's Passion deliberately localized altarpieces in Borgo San Sepulcro, a city that identified itself with the Holy Sepulcher, visualizing a continuing sense of locale. The Sant'Augustino altarpiece is the only one amongst its local predecessors in which episodes appeared in the main register of images, that is in the figure of St. Augustine, as well as in its predella. I would like to emphasize that even within the Catholic tradition, which privileges redundancy, this kind of repetition is extraordinary. Both sides of the saint's cope are drawn together by an enameled morse adorned with a tiny figure of Christ rising from his tomb. In the 15th century, morses were not only functional clasps, but insignia. This resurrection closes the passion cycle and imprints the saint with an image emblematic of Borgo. Like the copy of their city statutes that apparently bore the resurrected Christ in wax, Augustine appears to be impressed with a local seal. The pink color of Christ's cloak evokes both monumental depictions of the event at the heart of Borgo's most important civic and religious buildings, Piero's own fresco for the city's council chamber, which you see above, and the principal panel of Niccolo di Senia's high altarpiece for Borgo's abbey, abbey which you see below. The local resonance of images in Augustine's Orphrey also extends to Piero's choice of saints. Peter and Paul on the right shoulder were forefathers of the church, but also figured into Borgo's foundation legend. According to a mid-15th century account, the city's founding pilgrims on their way back from Jerusalem stopped in both Roman basilicas dedicated to the two holy apostles, St. Peter's and St. Paul's outside the walls. If the figure who accompanies St. John the Baptist on his opposite shoulder is indeed John the Evangelist, then Augustine is emblazoned with the twin patron saints of Florence and Borgo San Sepulcro. Further justification for my interpretation can be offered by way of comparison with an imitation of Piero's figure. His pupil, Luca Signorelli, adopted a similar image of Augustine in his altarpiece for Siena's Church of Sant'Augustino. Signorelli borrowed the model's rock crystal crozier and narrative orphrey with scenes that included the Annunciation, Nativity, and Baptism. And here you can see them. Yet he excluded from it the small standing saints, the resurrection, and episodes from Christ's passion. Indeed, Signorelli's version for Siena seems to suggest the specific relevance of Piero's St. Augustine to a Borgo audience. Piero's sensitivity to recent local precedent is also manifested here in the compositions he looked to for inspiration. One example has been identified in the saint that stood at the opposite end of Borgo Sant'Augustino altarpiece, flanking the central image, a monumental figure now in the Frick's own collection. Looming out of this painting, St. John the Evangelist's full-length figure is endowed with an overwhelming physical presence that befits a pillar of the Christian church. Brightly lit from the right, massive overlapping layers of a heavy crimson cloak create dramatic shadows that envelop his torso. Below, along the hem of John's robe, light catches a border of pearls, rubies, and aquamarines, 
the kind of gems that he created miraculously out of pebbles. Piero's aging apostle, as Dillian Gordon observed, was probably inspired by the same saint in Sassetta's polyptych for San Francesco in Borgo San Sepulcro, completed in 1444. You see uh, St. John the Evangelist by Sassetta here at the left. Sassetta's willowy figure of John bears the weathered features and double-pointed beard of a saint who, according to one medieval source, lived into extreme old age. Whether or not the Sienese painter initiated this vogue, Piero seems to have adapted Sassetta's elderly characterization of the evangelist in two of his own altarpieces. The Misericordia and St. Augustino polyptics both feature similar versions of the same saint, but transformed into a more physically substantial figure. Stylistically, the final result by each artist could not be more different, but Sassetta's characterization of John the Evangelist was a local success, and one which Piero clearly sought to develop. Both Sassetta's and Piero's patron saint of Borgo holds an open book with tiny clasps dangling from the bindings, a motif perhaps inspired by the local abbey's Trecento version of the same figure. So here you see the clasp dangling, and in the figure at the frick as well. While the former turns his eyes to the virgin and child who appear enthroned in the adjacent panel of this altarpiece, the Frick's aging apostle looks down to read from his text. This pensive ascetic stresses God's existence in the mind that is evoked in the opening lines of John's gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. By contrast, Piero St. Augustine, at the opposite end of the same polyptic, visualized the order of heaven, on liturgical trappings associated with the rituals of mass and pictured events in the life of Mary and Christ described in John's gospel. The entire altarpiece must have been a marvelous sight to behold. As I mentioned earlier, the art historian Giorgio Vasari described it as an object still worthy of high praise almost a hundred years after completion. Yet works of art, like music, clothes, and cars, eventually fall out of fashion. In 1555, the Augustinian friars moved to a new home and took their altarpiece with them. Removing this giant and purpose-built structure from the altar would have been no mean feat, requiring brute force, hammers, and saws. We can speculate that it was probably around this time that Piero's polyptic was chopped into sections, discarding the gilded frame, preserving the painted panels, and transforming his acclaimed altarpiece into easily portable parts. Its painted fragments were repurposed as masterpieces that attest to the talents of the city's storied painter. The little we know of their subsequent history has been carefully pieced together by modern scholars. Several surviving pieces hung on the walls of a private residence in Borgo San Sepulcro. In 1680, a guest to the home of Luca and Francesco Ducci listed four full-length saints that came from Piero's Augustinian altarpiece, that is the saints you see here, and I apologize for the only partial photograph of St. Augustine. Then, as today at the Frick, the curious visitor singled out St. Augustine and marveled over the narrative scenes decorating his cope. That Augustine, Michael, John, and Nicholas remained together after the altarpiece was dismantled is further confirmed by overpaint preserved along the edges. As you can see from these early 20th century photographs, the exposed spandrels of each panel were gessoed and covered with black paint. You can see it up here at the top. It defined a uniform profile for all of the figures and may have been undertaken in preparation for their display together in the Casa Ducci. The collection also included four fragments of the predella by the same artist depicting the Passion of Christ. The Frick's crucifixion is the sole surviving scene and shares with each full-length saint the same overpainted black edges here at the top and bottom. Between 1680 and 1900, all the extant fragments of Piero's altarpiece left Borgo San Sepulcro and were dispersed into collections in Europe and the United States. Many of these journeys remain unresolved, but the Frick St. John the Evangelist bears some traces of its travels. Two wax seals, once affixed to the back of the painting and today preserved in our curatorial files, display partially identifiable insignia. At the right, barely visible anymore, is a pair of heraldic devices, including that of the Dukes or Counts Folk of Cardona, an ancient Spanish noble family. On the left is an imperial eagle of the Holy Roman Empire that has been identified as the Milanese seal of export used when that city was subject to Austrian rule. The chronology is still unclear, but they suggest that this painting belonged to a member of the Cardona family and left Italy via Milan, probably at the beginning of the 19th century. 
identical seals on the back of St. Augustine, and slightly better preserved, as seen here in these photographs, indicate that both full-length saints in this exhibition shared a common owner before they eventually parted company. Our understanding of this episode and their history is incomplete, but both paintings lingered in obscurity for many years, their fame masked by attributions to other artists. Today it may seem difficult to believe, but the name Piero della Francesca was not always widely known beyond his hometown. Forgotten for centuries after his death in 1492, the painter was only discovered by foreigners in the mid-1800s. The establishment of a direct railway line in the 1860s facilitated the journey of English artists, collectors, and connoisseurs to Arezzo. Their visit to Piero's Legend of the True Cross fresco cycle there were often breathtaking and transformative experiences. Some even ventured further afield to Borgo San Sepulcro, where opportunities for private collectors abounded. In Piero's Tuscan hometown, they seized on his rare altarpieces and the portable fragments of them. One was the nativity, which still belonged to Piero's descendants, seen here. Another was his baptism of Christ, plucked from the center of a local altarpiece and exported to England. By the mid-19th century, both paintings had entered the collection of London's National Gallery, joining a smaller fragment of a third altarpiece, the St. Augustino Polyptic, depicting St. Michael Archangel. Like many English collectors of the 19th century, the daughter of Henry Clay Frick fell in love with Piero in Patria. Between 1923 and 1925, Helen Clay Frick went to Italy for the first time. Guided by the art historian F. Mason Perkins, she hit every stop along the so-called Piero Trail. The greatest hits tour of his work, later canonized by the connoisseur John Pope Hennessy and the British author John Mortimer. Postcards of his paintings collected in her scrapbook document the journey and her growing enthusiasm. The artist's hometown of San Sepulcro was increasingly the destination of choice for dedicated Piero pilgrims, and Miss Frick devoted three pages of her journal to it. Two of them shown here, include reproductions of his famous resurrection fresco, which Aldous Huxley had described as the best picture in the world, and below it, the Misericordia altarpiece, so that you can see here. Suffice to say that this 36-year-old returned home a convert to the cult of Piero, and one seeking a relic of the master's own work. In March 1936, several international arts journals made an announcement that shook the art world. The venerable New York firm of Nodler and Company had discovered a previously unknown painting by Piero della Francesca. It had come from the Vienna Palace of Eugene Miller von Eicholtz, a local nobleman whose family had fallen upon hard times. Their collection included spectacular paintings like Giovanni Battista Tiepolo's Ca Dolphin canvases, one of which now greets every visitor to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Unlike the Tiepolos, this mysterious figure was known to family friends only as the Prophet and the Millers were unaware that it was a masterpiece by Piero della Francesca. When they finally decided to sell it in 1935, the profit was first placed in the hands of a local dealer. The hapless salesman apparently could not afford the rent on a gallery space and stored this picture in the cloakroom of a Vienna hotel while he hunted for a buyer. Eventually, the famed art historian Wilhelm Suida identified the figure as a work by Piero della Francesca and hoped to publish it. Realizing his sudden windfall, however, the dealer and his painting quickly disappeared. So exciting was its discovery on American shores that for the first time, the art news broke with its editorial policy forbidding the publication of unexhibited pictures owned by dealers. On March 7th, this full-length photograph ran on the front page. They described St. Andrew, as he was then known, as, quote, one of the most important Italian pictures ever to reach this country, and a remarkable addition to the known oeuvre of a master, whose extant works are among the rarest of the period." Unquote. Unmentioned was the fact that negotiations for its acquisition by the Frick Collection were practically complete. A few weeks earlier, Helen Clay Frick, in her capacity as chairman of the Art Acquisitions Committee, had paid a visit to Nodler's. Very impressed by its grandeur and monumentality, she then wrote to several art historians requesting expert opinions. Their responses were moving and powerful. Just to take one example, the connoisseur of Italian Renaissance painting, Richard Offner, dubbed it, quote, the greatest thrill he had had in many years, unquote. Not surprisingly, an equally enthused coterie of Frick trustees immediately approved the record expenditure of $400,000. As the inaugural acquisition of the Frick's collection, Piero Saint crowned the recently opened museum with a gem worthy of its palatial surroundings and one long sought after by the daughter of its founder. 
Immensely proud of the new addition to her family collection, Helen Clay carefully orchestrated its royal entrance to the mansion in this very room. One spectator wrote, quote, at the beginning of April, a new picture arrived. Miss Frick, overflowing with superlatives, at once appeared on the scene in the dual capacity of chairman of the Art Acquisitions Committee and Arbitrix Elegantarium. She directed Nodler to place the Piero on the lecture room platform, that is this stage that you see here, on an easel draped in green velvet. In this robe of honor, it was admired by favored spectators. What was certainly the most spectacular Piero she acquired was not the Frick's last. Fifteen years later, Nodler supplied the museum with two more saints, the small figures of Monica and Leonard dressed in black Augustinian habits. Finally, in 1961, trustee John D. Rockefeller Jr. donated the crucifixion. As you can see in this photograph, St. John normally commands the West Gallery Vista, attracting visitors into the adjoining enamels room, where a shrine to Piero awaits them. With four paintings by Piero della Francesca, the Frick can claim the largest collection of his works in any institution outside of Italy. Three more by the same artist are to be found in Washington, Williamstown, and Boston. All seven Pieros in the United States are a testament to the fascination of American collectors with a Renaissance master's painting. That each one was originally made for Borgo San Sepulcro is a remarkable coincidence of fate. Located on American shores, they give this old master an adopted home in the New World and make the East Coast a place of pilgrimage for devotees of his art. Here at the Frick, his four magisterial works transform Henry Clay's house on Fifth Avenue into the final stop along the Piero Trail. Thank you.